Who knows? All right, back to where we're at. <laughs> so which of the following tissue types is associated with CTE? Neurofibrillary tangles, tau proteins, substantia nigra, or glial cells? Tau proteins. Tau proteins, B. Which of the following is thought to be the cause of CTE? Repeated trauma to the head, alcohol abuse, having one severe concussion, or playing non-contact sports? Repeated trauma to the head. There are some people that think that alcohol abuse can exacerbate it, which would make sense. Um, but for now, we're kind of just going with contact to the head. And potentially genetic <laughs> links as well. Which of the following is found post-mortem in people with CTE? Occipital lobe hypertrophy, temporal lobe atrophy, frontal lobe atrophy, or cerebellar hypertrophy? Okay. Frontal lobe atrophy. Um, if, you, uh, if you put temporal lobe atrophy, I gave you that one too, because it is, it is frontotemporal. Oh, frontal. Yeah. So, yeah, any, if you put one or both of those, you got credit for it. So the temporal lobe is associated with what generally? Hearing. Balance. Language. Short-term memory. Emotions. Is it balanced too? Mm. Yeah. And the, front, the prefrontal cortex is associated with? Higher-level Higher level thinking. Emotions. Predictions, dealing with the future, uh, reason, ration. Um, it's not really where we store memories per se, like we use the parietal lobe more to store long-term memories and the temporal lobe, just to, like the hippocampus, just to store more short-term memories. And the amygdala is kind of what we use as our fear center. Um, you know, that's, that's part of like the reason why we talk about like the scared world, like we're always naysayers and doomsayers and oh my gosh, everything is going to hell because of this president or that president or, you know, crimes up or down. Like we're wired to be afraid. All of our ancestors that survived were afraid of everything. They're afraid of elephants and afraid of you know, spirits and lions, and that's what made them survive. So we are predisposed to believe in deities or predisposed to think that everything's falling apart around us, even though, like, there's really never been a better time to be alive. So, like, a lot of times you have to step back away from it because the sensationalism of social media and the, and the press and everything else, they, they also capitalize on you being upset and fearful, and, and it's like, it's not that bad. We're doing pretty good. Take it easy. Take it easy, exactly. But, yeah, they, they play on, you know, the amygdala for one thing. All right. So which of the following fractures is most likely to create an open fracture? Compound fracture, stress fracture, Salter-Harris fracture, or apophyseal fracture? Compound. Compound fracture. Good. Could you have an open stress fracture? Very unlikely. Uh, Salter-Harris fracture? Could you have an open Salter-Harris fracture? A little more likely, but probably not. Because you could really break the ankle badly to where it goes both through the tibia, the growth plate, and the, and the talus. Mm -hmm. um, but you fracture it to the point where the tibia could be sticking out. Not, not very common, but it's possible. Okay. A football player is struck in the thigh with a helmet and has severe bruising and an antalgic gait. What is the most likely injury? A grade 3 muscle tear, a muscle contusion, a grade 3 MCL tear, severe bursitis? It's a muscle contusion. So the key here is struck in the thigh with a helmet. So um, the severe bruising and antalgic gait, those would go hand in hand with that. But because it was in the thigh, again, we didn't specify if the foot was stuck in the ground. Um, we didn't specify medial or lateral movement of the knee. So we're going to go ahead and assume that it's a contusion based on that description. You're not going to get bursitis in the middle of the thigh. So if a patient presents with atrophic Achilles tendonitis or tendinopathy, which of the following would not be appropriate? Manual therapy on the Achilles tendon area, eccentric strengthening of the plantar flexor group, concentric strengthening of the dorsiflexing group, using the stairs at work. And we've had this on multiple tests, and you guys are still missing it. It's manual therapy on the Achilles tendon area. The key word there is atrophic Achilles tendonitis. So it's already thinning, it's already fraying, it's weak. What we don't want to do is put any manual pressure there because we can weaken it more and cause it to rupture. If it's hypertrophic, we can get in and, in and around the area, but generally speaking, like I'll see people doing a, like instrument assisted on the Achilles tendon, and I'm like, ooh, no, no, no. No, 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 no. Not what we want there. Like wash off? I mean, you're, you're predisposing people to rupturing an Achilles tendon. Like, you should not be doing cross-fiction scraping on the Achilles tendon. Right. 
Yeah, and the, the, the relative amount of force that goes into the Achilles tendon is exponentially higher than pretty much anywhere else in the body. The only other tendon that comes close is the patellar tendon, but it's still not even in the same ballpark as the Achilles. Like, the Achilles takes massive, like, exponentially more than your own body weight, between 6 and 20 times with every step. So that's, that's one we cannot afford to mess with. Yeah. So one thing you have to make sure is the calcaneus is moving properly because a stuck calcaneus is going to give you Achilles problems, right? Because it's not getting the proper stretch to it. Um, obviously, gastroc soleus. Um, so you're kind of going to treat around it but not on it. Think about it like the, like tennis elbow, right? Like you're not going to get anywhere near the actual tendon because it's fraying and you don't want it to be weaker. And those are two of the areas that we really focus on eccentric exercises to really try to elongate and strengthen the tissue to where it's thicker and more durable. Generally speaking, though, like eccentric does pretty well for tendonitis. Like even patellar tendonitis, once you've already cleared out like the adhesions and the, and the myofascial problems there, then when we bring eccentric exercises in, then it works really well. The problem is most people are too tight in the quads first, they start doing eccentric first, and it makes it worse because we didn't get full range of motion to begin with. Which of the following is not a sign of an active trigger point? Imme extreme sensitivity to pressure, immediate bruising, referral of pain to other structures, or twitch response? Immediate bruising. What would cause immediate bruising? Tear, potentially? Damage to vascularity, primarily. Capillary beds and veins. <clears throat> Um, you could also have somebody that's on blood thinners if they're on, you know, aspirin 81 or warfarin or coumadin. Or even people that are on too much omega-3 or omega-7 can have too much blood thinning. Alcoholics? Alcoholics, sure. Like, that's one that people don't realize. Like, people that do a lot of fish oil, like, they, they bleed more, they don't clot as well. Which can be helpful in not clotting and not stroking, but it also can make you predisposed to bleeding. So, like, people that are on coumadin and warfarin, like, they're, they're at a, a very high risk for internal bleeding. So you can imagine if they have any kind of, you know, vascular damage anywhere, we can really have problems with that. Which is like the tricky thing with elderly people, right? So like you're on AF you have AFib, so you're a stroke risk, and then we give you, you know, this um, you know, medication to get your blood pressure down, which in, in an anticoagulant as well. And then if they're taking like ibuprofen or anything else. Right. That? Like the patient I told you about that was taking aspirin, ibuprofen, Aleve, hydro uh, oxy, Tylenol, okay. Toradol. Whoa. So, you know, there's no way we could have treated that patient, right? Like, there's no possible way. Like, everything we do is fairly aggressive. Like, we can't work on her. So keep that in mind. That's why you always want to have, you know, medication lists on your intake form so you know what you're working with. Because certain medications can predispose patients to different things. You know, like, for example, if somebody has diffuse joint pain, one thing you might want to check is to see if they're on statins. There's a lot of people, if they lower their dose, then a lot of that joint pain goes away. And there's oftentimes you can, you can lower your dose in half, and you still get the, the cholesterol benefits out of it, but you don't necessarily deal with all the side effects. Like, most of them have, like, a kind of a tiered response to where the higher you go, the benefits don't go any higher, but the side effects go much higher. And, of course, people are always going to assume more is better, right? It's like, well, my doctor prescribed me this amount, so I'll just take twice as much because I want to get twice as much out of it. That's not how that works. <laughs> Remember titration from biology? All right, what is the most common primary bone cancer in adolescence? Osteochondroma, diffuse lipoma, leukemia, osteosarcoma. Osteosarcoma. And then where is the above lesion most commonly found? The knee, shoulder, cervical, spine, or ankle? Knee. Knee, knee is the most common. So, um, so an osteochondroma is what? It's a bone tumor, bone cancer. What is it? Histologically, what is it made out of? Cartilage. Cartilage, good. Cartilage growing out of bone, right? Like the word speaks for itself, an osteochondroma. Okay. And diffuse lipomas, what are those? Fatty pockets. They're fatty tumors, and usually they're going to be all over the place. Like it's very rare to have one. Most people, when they have lipomas, have them all over the place. So you may have seen them before, all over their back, their thighs, um, which those people oftentimes can be very um, uncomfortable for them to use a foam roller or something like that because, they're, because of these little tumors, which are not cancerous, but they, they don't get the same response out of the, the muscles. So they're a challenge to work with. There's a couple areas that people will assume you have lipomas. One is going to be right here on the neck, so you'll have people that do a lot of squats, 
and they put the bar on their spine at like C7. So they start to get this thickening there of the supraspinous ligament. And doctors will tell them that it's a lipoma. It's not. They've managed to irritate their supraspinous ligament to the point where it's swollen and thickened. And they'll have this, you know, hump back here. And, right. What's, what's that called when somebody's getting older, or they've got a bad posture, and they've got that hump there? Good. So that is a response that is what, what, uh, what law? Davis or Thomas? Yeah. Or Wilson? What about Thomas? <laughs> Thomas the trade, yeah. Yeah. So it's a Davis's law, right? But you all, you also might get some of uh, Wolf's law as well. And sometimes you might get some Wilson's law. Just, it's just a volleyball with a face on it. <laughs> all right. So where's the above lesion? Oh, we already did that one. After a sprained ankle, what is the primary cause of antalgic gait after the first week is over? This has also been on multiple tests. There are multiple courses. Secondary tendonitis, compartment syndrome, excessive ability to dorsiflex the foot, atrophy of the affected ligaments. Secondary tendonitis. Secondary tendonitis. You're generally not going to get atrophy of ligaments, right? Like ligaments don't really go through hypertrophic or atrophic phases. Mm -hmm. Mostly what they're going to do is become lax or they're going to scar over and they're going to use other types of connective tissue to scar over and basically simulate or, or, or look like a ligament. What is that? It's a rebel. I can't see. I don't know who's telling me. All right. So with the sprained ankle, do we have excessive ability to dorsiflex or, or lack of dorsiflexion generally? Lack of dorsiflexion. Um, compartment syndrome, are we really going to see that from a sprained ankle? Probably not. I mean, you could maybe have a high ankle sprain that could turn into that, but you know, it's usually too low. Like, we're not in the compartments anymore. Okay. Medial epicondylitis is also known as tennis elbow, nursemaid's elbow, golfer's elbow, or funny bone syndrome. Nursemaid's. Golfers. What is nursemaid's elbow? It's when you pick a child up by their arm and you dislocate their radial head or their elbow. Huh? Yeah. yeah. We did. What's funny bone syndrome? It's your ulnar nerve. I don't know. I just made it up. What condition is a corticosteroid injection highly effective for? Muscle strains, tendonitis, fasciitis, or bursitis? Strains? Bursitis. Right? So in a muscle strain, we, we don't want to decrease inflammation. We actually need inflammation to heal. Inflammation is very necessary for the healing process. So when you're taking NSAIDs and you're trying to heal from something, you're actually slowing the healing process down. Like you actually need inflammation to heal. That inflammation brings about, you know, cellular um, growth. It brings about increased oxygen to the area. It brings about red blood cells and, and nutrients. Um, without that, you have no reason for your body to try to repair that area. That's where the theory about prolo comes from. Bursitis. Because bursitis doesn't have contractile tissue, it truly is inflamed. So a corticosteroid injection will basically knock that out right away. Because corticosteroids inhibit inflammation? Yes. Okay. So you shouldn't give more than one in that particular area of lifetime? Um, generally, it's three per year. I'd have to recheck the, the Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And it changes from year to year, but generally it's three per year in an area. Um, but you can also have, they can also cut the bursa, the bursa sac out if it continues to be a problem. Like some people will get swelbo over and over again. or um, So you don't, bursa sacs aren't super duper duper necessary. And if they're more problematic than otherwise, then you just kind of cut it out. You don't want a needle bursa. Not bursa. Um, potentially. Potentially. Poking little holes, causing bleeding, yeah. There, there's two, so there's two parts to why I believe needling really works. One is a biological mechanism of, of inhibition. So just in the same way, I, I think there's some concept behind pain actually being necessary to turn the muscle off. 
as a protection mechanism. Think about like if you step on something sharp. Immediately what you're going to have is a reflexive response to pull you away from it. It happens before the signal even goes to your brain. Like you don't get a chance to think about it. You pull your foot off of that sharp object to protect you. So our, our body knows to stay away from sharp things. So if a porcupine gets its quill into you, essentially what happens, the more you try to contract the muscle, the, the further in it burrows. So what's going what's gonna to try to do is try to relax it so that it doesn't damage more of the myofibrils. So what I think happens there when we put a needle in, whether it's through a corticosteroid injection, dry needling, whatever else, is that needle actually turns the muscle from the inside out through multiple mechanisms, including affecting the, ar the sarcomere, but by affecting the nerve bundles, by tricking your body to think it's being stabbed, it tries to turn that off to limit the damage, so it really turns the muscle off significantly. But also, pistoning is going to cause, you know, little tears and little holes in the muscle, which cause bleeding. It creates an inflammatory response. mostly pronator teres.